Now just a little thing about chapter 9. They break up the parts of this into a different section. So section 9.5 is going to have the complete, all five steps. They reference a worksheet in the back of the book to use. I want you to always do these steps. When it says conduct a hypothesis test, we're going to do these steps. They're actually the same steps the book uses, just in a better order. Because the book does everything with the calculator. And you know where I stand on that shit. Um, so let's kind of go through this one step at a time here. The part A is what we just talked about. The idea of a claim being made and the, and the hoe and the high. What's the claim being made in this problem? 7.25. So the claim has to involve some feeling about a measurement. Some 41 is a number of things. Say again? The mean is equal to 8.65 years. That 8.65 years, where did it come from? Where did that 8.65 come from? The sample. the sample. So that's the thing we're going to use to test the claim. So the sample information will never show up as a claim because I have to have a claim first before I go take a sample to test it. And it's not a claim because I can, I can see that the sample has a mean of 8.65. What's the claim being made? Somebody believes something. We live longer in captivity. Yes, cool. That the Minnesota coyote lives longer in captivity. Longer in captivity. So, the mean of all coyotes in the wild is 7.25 years. So what would Phil think about the average of coyotes living in captivity? He thinks they live longer in captivity. So he thinks the mean is... Greater than 7.25. You guys see that? So this does take some reading and some translation. It's a math. It's a foreign language of math. Which one does that go in for? It could be either one. The claim doesn't have to be one or the other. I'm very nice here. Do you have to put like the years after the number? Or no. It doesn't matter. No. In the middle of the problem is all numbers. When we get it to the end, we better bring back the units oh, when we're describing what we're doing. So which one is that going to be, the, the null or the alternate? The alternate? Yeah, why? There's no equal sign. It's crazy. So if, they, if Phil would have said he thinks they live at least as long, it would have been greater than or equal to, that would have been the HO because it's got an equal sign in it. You guys see how that works? So figure out what the claim is first. You don't have to worry about anything else in the problem. This is not a word problem. I want you guys to understand. A word problem is where we create our own equation. Are we going to create our own equation? No, we got equations we're going to use. We're going to just plug shit in there. But the mistake students make here is the same one they make in word problems. So you think that you have to know everything before you can do anything. No, the first thing I care about is what's the claim. I don't give a shit about 3.27. I don't care about the sample I took. and None of that shit matters. Who thinks something is true? Ah, that's the claim. Then put that in the right place. Like you said, it's going to go here. This is the one. The high is the one that I can always show evidence for. So if I take a sample, now, now, let me ask you this before you even write the hope. Uh, <laughs> where am I going to want my sample to show up to show evidence for this? Do I want it, you know, which side of 7.25? Do I want it to show up to show evidence for this? Equal to? I mean... 
If it equaled 7.25, I mean, would that be evidence that it was bigger? I mean, you put that within the... the Give me a number that you would want it to be. 18. 8. Or, what say again? Did you say 18? 18. Oh, 8. Okay. I was going to say uh -huh. 18. I'm really old coach. Uh, so, I want it to be bigger. I want my sample. There's only one place that would show evidence. So above 7.25. So you the same thing, but you switched the sign. Uh, wait. No, I'm not talking about the hole yet. All right? Oh. I'm getting this... All right. So, how many tail tests will this be? What's the only tail I care about? The lower tail or the upper tail for this problem? Upper tail. So, this is a one tail test. I told you that T score chart is set up for one and two tails. This is why. These tests can be one or two tail. The only time it's going to be two tail is if my high says not equal to. Because what does not equal to mean? Does it mean bigger or smaller? Smaller. I love you. You're awesome. You, you, just, you just pick one of them and go. Not equal to. Does it mean bigger or smaller? Let's say bigger. So on. Not equal to. Is it bigger or smaller? Beautiful. There you go. It's both. Could be either one. If I think it's not equal to something, what's going to be evidence of that? Something smaller or something bigger? You guys see, that's why we call it a two-tail test, because then the sample could show up either direction. In this case, where I, where's the only place the sample can show up to show me evidence? Up. So it's a one-tail test. In fact, it's a one-tail test that way for you guys, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, it is a one-tail test. What is the hoe, like Jackie was saying, it's going to be? No. I thought that's what you were explaining. Less than no. Equal to. Less than equal to. So this is a one-tail test. In fact, which tail am I interested in? I this one. One tail test because if it shows up in the other tail, it sucks for me or for Phil in this case, right? Because he thinks it's greater, and if it shows up way down there, it's like, man, that's evidence that it's less than shit. Okay, you guys are right now going, Oh, I'm gonna love this chart. So the H1 would rather not have one or two tails, but it says yes, good, I love it. The H1 tells me how many tails it's gonna have because it shows me where the evidence is required. And to show evidence that it's greater than, it's got to be way the hell up there. Okay. What? If it was less than, it obviously would be that way. If it's not equal to, it could be either way. That would be a two-tail test. Mm -hmm. So if he said he feels that they live a different amount of time, <laughs> that would have been mu not equal to, that would have been a two-tail test. Okay. Maybe. Now, part B is old news, believe it or not. What part of this problem will tell me? There's two things you have to tell me here. And again, this is the sheet that explains every damn step, right? So this is the sheet to freaking hold on to when you're doing this stuff. So is it normally distributed? I have to know it's normal before I can use Z or T. So do we know if this is normally distributed? Does it say it is? Does it say it is? No, but... Sample size is bigger than 30. So, and it's, so one thing I've got to say is it's normal because n equals 41 greater than 30. Check. And what's the second thing? Now I can figure out which thing I want to use. Or which thing can I use? And again, the formula's add up here a second here. The sigma goes with z and the s goes with t. Which standard deviation do we know? Population one, so what am I allowed to use? Z scores. I only have to use the T if I only know the sample standard deviation. That's that's the T is covering me for having an estimate. But we know frickin' sigma. We're cool. We know sigma. Sigma known. So I can use Z scores. So the first step is, what the hell are you talking about? The second step is, what are you allowed to use to talk about it? And the third step is going to be, what's going to be far enough away? The whole idea of a hypothesis test is, what's far enough away, and did we make it far enough away? Right? So a quick little word about this whole idea up here. Um, let's say I had a football team, and everybody on my team is slow as shit, right? You want at least one person that can haul some ass, right? 
Uh, so I hold open tryouts for my team. And I'm going to have them run, you know, the length of the football field twice and see who can do that the quickest, right? Maybe once at first and then twice to see who's got the best stamina. Um, so I'm going to set a benchmark, right? I'm going to say, this is going to be evidence you should be on my team. You've got to do this in so much time. And if you don't do it in that much time, you're out. If you do it in that much time, I'm going to keep you in consideration. You guys with me? I have a benchmark that if you get past that, I'm going to consider you. If you don't, no, I forget you. So this idea of what far enough away is, it used to be two. That was where things started getting unusual. Now it could be different, but that's still going to be the benchmark I set. So if I'm the insurance company and you're trying to save money because you say, well, I added all this shit to my house, I should, have, I should be, I'm going to set the bar really high. <laughs> you got to show me like crazy evidence because I want to continue making money because I'm an asshole insurance company, right? Or some of them, are not. Well, what was the point? Right. You guys kind of with me? Whereas if I'm at the nuclear power plant and I'm talking about evidence to get off my ass and go check things, I'm going to set that bar pretty low. I, I want to pass that test really easy. Oh, it's, it's starting to move toward the yellow. Let me go see what the hell's going on, man. I don't even want to get let it get close to a situation. You guys, so I want to be able to change that idea of unusual, change the idea of what's far enough away based on how bad the results would be if I was wrong. Right? Does that kind of make sense? A little bit, a little bit. So this next step here is how far away, far away enough is. This step tells us how far away a sample has to get to show evidence against this guy, the null, for this guy. So who remembers what that alpha means? That little fishy dude, the little Greek letter alpha. What does that alpha mean? Anybody remember? So I talked about when we talked about the T-score chart. Okay, so it's related to the number of sides, yes. Alpha is the area in the tail or tails. That's what it is. And that's why I said alpha over two would be what they talk about for confidence intervals. Because when I make a confidence interval, how many tails do I make? Two. So I have an alpha, I'm going to cut it in half for each tail, right? Is the area of the tail? Or tail. Because right, it could be one or two. And we have a how many tail test? One. We have a one tail test. Up here, right? So I want point oh one to be in this tail. We're using Z scores, right? So Z scores. I want point oh one in this tail. Can you guys figure out what the Z score is for what far enough away it is? Use the T score chart, it's so kick ass because it's got the tails and it's got the alpha up there already. So, really, that T score chart is set up for this chapter. See, I have I already gave away some T score charts, right? If you don't have one at the moment, that's too bad. Hold on. Oh, right, here we go. Anybody else need T scores? I need a Z score. <laughs> Say again? Oh, hell yeah. Is everybody okay with the fact that I'm going to use a T score chart to get a Z score? Is everybody cool with that fact? If you're not, that's okay. We could all be insane. You're like, I'm the only sane person in here. What should I do about that? No. Why can I use a T score chart to find Z scores? Because T scores become Z scores when the sample gets large. So they're all down here. There's Z scores. What's alpha? What is problem? 101. How many tail tests? One tail. 0.01. I go all the way down. If I stop, I get a T score. Go all the way down, I get a Z score. So I got a 2.326. So again, if I got that. If I got that um, football team, am I going to set the benchmark at the average time it takes somebody to run that far? No, I want a freaking fast person. I want Rocket Israel, yes. Okay, so the 0.01, you got it from there, and you went all the way to the bottom, and Yes. So if you stop... Why large, though? Yeah. 
So the bigger the sample is, what's true about S? How do we feel about the S that we get? If our sample gets bigger, do we feel better about the S or worse? If our sample gets bigger, do we feel... If the sample gets bigger, we feel better about the S. If the sample is large enough, we don't need T-scores to cover our ass for not knowing. We Now we go, the S is, is approximately the same as sigma because it's such a big sample. So that's why they left it large because it's really uh, depends on our viewpoint of what large enough is. So if you want a Z-score, you just go to the bottom of the T-chart. Because when are T-scores mostly needed when I have a small sample and I really don't know what, I don't know how to feel about S. It could be really far off. But the bigger my sample gets, the closer T-scores get to Z-scores until they become Z-scores at the bottom. That's why that freaking chart's so awesome and does double duty. So it just, what I always say is if you stop, you'll get a T-score. If you go all the way down, you'll get a Z-score. So make sure you're doing the right thing at the right time. You ever want a Z-score, which means I want to go all the way down. So if it doesn't, so the very, very last number. I love it. So double check me there. I got this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like it. So what if it doesn't? Like it doesn't. It's not supposed to be bigger. So if in if in that second step I figured out that I have to use t scores, then I have to figure out the degrees of freedom, and I stop there. Degrees. Then that would be a t score, just like last time. Does that make sense? So here I don't have to worry about degrees of freedom because it's a z score I want. Mm -hmm. Going to go all the way down. Okay, so now, unusual before was 2, now it's 2.326. It's just a little bit further out. That's, that's my benchmark for evidence. My sample, uh, I'm going to take the sample, I'm going to make its own z-score, and I'm going to see where it falls. So it's just like the coach saying, you got to run this far in 10 seconds, <laughs> right? If you can do it in less than 10 seconds, I'll think about you for the, for the team, right? That, then the, that's the benchmark. You with me? So if somebody takes longer, you're out. If somebody takes less time, I'll think about you. Come over here. Okay. So here, this is the benchmark. If you get past this, that's evidence. Right? Here's the middle. Here's the, the, the HO. If I get a sample that is so far away from that, that's evidence that that's in the wrong place, that the mean is actually in a different place, just like we were saying earlier about my clinic. Okay. So it's all about distance away, right? Let's assume that is the middle, but look what I just did. I just got so freaking far away that can't be the middle. That's the whole idea behind this. The most important, uh, two most important steps are C and D. What's far enough away and how far did we make it? Right? Don't suddenly think that I said you only have to worry about those two steps. Those are the two most important steps. Um, so now we know. Let's, let's try to say this in words. Oh, shit. This is a, this is a what again? What kind of, what, this is a, this is a Z-score, 11. We're going to calculate another Z-score in a minute. So I always give it its own little symbol. I call it Z-star, the one that we make from our sample. You'll see why in a minute. That's my own personal thing that I do. Because I'm weak. I'm okay with it. So watch this. This is how we say this in words. We say, if the Z-star we get is bigger than 2.326. It's in here. If, it's, if, if the sample we get is way the hell out here, and the mean thinks that the average is in here somewhere, that's what the null thinks. What do we think about the null? If we get a sample way the hell out here, what do we think about the high? Let's do that first. If we get a sample way out here, what do we, how do we feel about this guy? Feel pretty good, because that says the mean is greater than 7.25, and we got way the hell bigger than 7.25. How do we feel about the HO, then? If we think the HI looks good, looks like it might be right, we look at the HO and say, it looks like you probably are wrong. Does that make sense? They're opposite statements, so if one of them looks right, the other one must look wrong. They're opposite statements. So watch this. Let me show this works. If the Z star... <laughs> If the Z star is bigger than 2.326, we can reject the null, or affectionately known as reject the hope, support the high. And normally I have a class that 
can accept that. The wording is most interesting and suspect and can handle it, it just being a humorous way to look at it. <laughs> Hopefully you guys are able to do that. I have my suspicions. We can reject the hope, support the hunt. So, so again, let me, let me recap. What does this guy think? That the mean is down here somewhere. If we get way the hell up here, then that means that guy looks wrong. That's why we can reject him. But at the same time, if he looks wrong, he must look correct. We can support this guy. Can we prove this guy? No. We can't prove shit. Too bad for us. But we can show really strong evidence for something, which is very true to life. You can never prove somebody killed somebody with malicious intent completely. That's why you gotta have a long ass trial and all this shit, right? Okay. Um, so, so let's recap. Uh, what are the positions? What are we talking about? What are we allowed to use to talk about it? What is going to be far enough away? We set up now what's called the rejection region. Do we see? Do you see why we call it that? Because if we make it in here, we reject it. All. That's why we call it the rejection region. The book calls it the critical region. I think. But so it makes sense that we immediately then, once we set up what far enough away is for a sample, we see how far away our sample got. So somebody help me out. What do we know from the sample? Somebody give me some information about the sample. Look back up here. What do we know about the sample? Yeah, the number is 41, 11. What else do we know? Yeah, the mean was 8.65. And there's something else we know for any group of wolves, of northern Minnesota coyotes, sorry, is that the standard deviation of all of them is 3.27. Now I want to calculate a z-score, but I took a sample, and I'm talking about the means, so what has to change? I took a sample, I'm talking about the means, what has to change? Change sigma, change the standard deviation. This is the one that works for individual coyotes. I want one that works for groups of 41 coyotes. So how do I change this dude? Yeah, 3.27 divided by square root of 41. Whatever the hell that is. You need a calculator, by the way, as always. You can kind of get one. You got an IB. What do you guys get? Does anybody get anything? Yes, five one. Let's see. It's either five one oh seven or five one one. Use 511. You can use 5107. It's even a little better. I love it. It's got to be at least three places. Could be four. And now I can make a z-score. Now, the z-score formula never changes. And we've actually done this already, but just to remind you guys, the z-score formula is always my data minus the middle divided by the spread. Always. What are we assuming this to be in this problem? Did that start? Up here? No. Yeah. No. Cool, yeah. start. Thank you. What are we assuming the mean, to, the mu to be? We're assuming it to be what? Mm -mm. If we do that, then it'll never show evidence of anything. It'll always be the middle. We assume it to be 7.25. Assuming that the 7.25 number is the middle. We want to show that we got a sample so far away from it that it can't be the middle. This is proof by contradiction. Assuming this is true, look at this shit. Oh shit, that can't be true then. So then this would be, what's our x bar we got? 8.65. 8.65 minus the mean. We assume it to always be the thing in the claim. 7.25. We assume this to be the real middle. 7.25. Divided by the new standard deviation, 0.511. Like 2.7 or eight. I could be wrong. The 
That's a little start. No, that's the end. No, no, that's trying to be an X bar. Oh. That's the meaning of the sample means. Hello, guys. You're all like, oh, you learn how to write. Two points. Two points. What's that for? Now, now, before you answer the rest of this question, can you guys put that on the picture from earlier? Where's 2.74 up here? Yeah, it's in here, right? Put a little star on it. Oh, that's why Jeff calls it Z-star. I love it. Good job, Jeff. Um, did we make it far enough away? Yes, we found evidence for something. In fact, look at what past us did. Oh, past us, being so nice. Was our Z-star bigger than this? Yeah, we can confirm it computationally and visually that it's bigger. So then what are we able to do? We're able to do this shit. We can reject the mean, the, the null, I keep calling it. We can reject the null. This guy looks wrong. We can support the high. That guy looks right. It's way the hell up here. What did the high think? He, the high thought the mean was greater than this. And where did we end up? We ended up way the shit up here. So it does look like it's bigger than 7.25 because we got so much bigger, we got so much higher than it. So right here we can say reject the null, support the high. That's what we can do with that. Reject the hope. Reject the hope. Support the high. Sounds like interesting life <laughs> advice, but don't. It's true, like bad advice. Yeah, no. I'm not sure how to make it. <laughs> Sounds like propositions in Catholic. Um, real quick, remember earlier I was talking about if that was the score we got, how unlikely was it to be up there? What was the probability it was that or more? That's what we call the p-value. So watch, watch this connection. Uh, and again, guys, listen, listen. I'm laying a lot on you right now. Yeah, Am I aware of this? Yeah, I'm aware of it. We're going to go through it several times so that you start to see the themes of it. You guys with me? If you pay enough attention, you start to see how things kind of connect. This is the first time we're doing this, so we're not supposed to get everything yet. Um... <sighs> This is kind of nifty. That was the z-score, that the far enough away z-score, right? the benchmark z-score. Alpha is the area of the tail of this guy. The p-value is the area of the tail of my z-score. That's how the connection goes. That's the analogy. So what's in the tail of 2.74? What's up here? And again, that's an old question. What's the tail of 2.74? Again, you're going to need a z-score chart to figure that out. So that's, is that in the tail? 9969 is where? Below. So what's in the tail? 0 0.0031. 0 0 How do you get that? This is the p value. 1 minus point. So this is point 0.9969. I love it. But is that the area of the tail? No, that's the area of the freaking body. I want the area just in the tail, so I'm going to do 1 minus that. So the p value is... 0 0.0031. That is the probability that I'm wrong when I reject the null. That is the probability that I just happened to get a sample that was this far away. So what's more likely that, yeah, I just did something with a 0.3% chance of happening just on the first try, or that the middle is in the wrong place? More likely that the middle's in the wrong place, right? There's always a chance that I'm wrong, and that's where people misinterpret clinical research. You have to reproduce somebody's results. 
Sometimes people rush to publication like, oh my God, we just proved that butter's good for you. And then a week later, oh shit, stop eating so much butter. <laughs> right? So you're just like, I'm not going to change my diet until all this shit calms down. Right? You guys really remember a while back, fat was so bad that they made the little cookies. And if you look back at those, they had like crazy amounts of sugar to make up for the fat that took out. <coughs> and they're like, oh man, that was wrong. We had that backwards. Sorry. Like, oh shit. Uh, so my whole point is, this is evidence, this is evidence that the claim is correct, that the, that the, um, that the mean really is greater than 7.25. This is evidence that Phil is right. Do you guys see that? Phil thought it was greater. This is evidence that it is greater. Does it prove that it's greater? Never. I don't care how small this gets. It doesn't prove it, but it's really good evidence. Let me write a conclusion then. Uh, I think after, I'm going to give you guys a little break after this and then we're going to do another problem, okay? You're all like, well, that's different, John. Yeah. All right. Here's our conclusion. And, and real quick, before I go there, this is what we figured out, right? The reject the null, support the high. Which one was our claim? Which one of those two was the claim? The claim was the. Which one? The high. The high. I love it. So that high is the claim. So what language am I going to use in the conclusion? This one. The one that talks about the claim. So here's how this sounds. We have found, right? Didn't we succeed? We got into the rejection region, so we succeeded. We have found sufficient evidence. To support, support the claim that the northern Minnesota coyote lives longer in captivity. So if you just say we found evidence to support the H1, that's not good enough. You have to actually talk about what the problem is talking about in the real world. All right, let's we'll take a 10-minute break. I'm going to pick back up at uh, 150. I can make it a no-minute break just to be an asshole up here. But let's take a 10-minute break instead. So come back, I'll start up at uh, 50 past, 10 till.